Research, and I'm going to mention some of their efforts as I go through the talk. 
First, a real quick introduction to what um, I called in the, in the title the Western Amazon. Um, I'm going to be talking um, mostly about Peru, the Amazonian part here. Iquitos will be come up when I talk about the Amazon research. Then the Andes of Peru here. Um, it's an area where climate, in terms of things that affect from year to year changes, um, you're exposed to the trade winds, the intertropical convergence zone that brings rainy season to this part here up into Central America, switches down in the, um, in the months of, let's be the opposite, of um, August, down into the southern part of the Amazon basin, giving you rains down here as the intertropical convergence zone shifts, bringing you precipitation changes and seasonality changes. Um, both in this part of Peru and Ecuador, though, that you're exposed to El Nino year. So they, this, this year is an El Nino year. And you might have seen there's especially strong rains in the, in the Andes right now in Peru. That's the El Nino uh, portion of the El Nino Southern Appalachian, the ENSO, which changes weather and climate conditions dramatically, say, every three to eight years on, on average. Um, and then other things that affect the land use and land cover themselves are if you're in the mountains, elevational gradients or dramatic changes in physical environmental features as you go up in elevation um, associated with changes in lapse rates. And when you're down in the Amazon, um, at least in the floodplain, very much controlled by flooding regimes, which are then connected um, to some of these climatic features, including rainfall in the Andes affecting flooding regimes down in the Amazon. So with that background, let me start into a little bit of um, characterization of work that I've been doing in the Andes. Uh, here's some uh, landscapes to give you a sense of the kind of environments we're talking about. This is in northern Peru, high elevation inside a national park, Huascaran National Park, uh, affected very dramatically by recent climate change, so the glaciers are retreating in, in this um, high Andean protected areas. Here's a very typical scene also on the, on the in a fairly humid environment, in this case on the eastern slope, central Andes eastern slope, a little bit of cloud forest on the top, but otherwise extensively farmed. Here's also a cloud forest site that's actually just above tree line. It's an Inca site in the northern Peruvian Andes, and then lots of um, abandoned terraces in a site in, in southern Peru. Real briefly, we're talking about these areas here, here, down here. When you work in these uh, landscapes, one of the striking things is the importance of past legacies of land use. So we're always sensitive to the fact that the vegetation you might be studying might be the result not of current environmental conditions, but due to past history of land use in the area. And in fact, agriculture is very ancient in Peru. Um, and it's fair to guess that the human impact is very ancient also. Uh, you pick up, as an example, lots of evidence of burning of landscapes starting very strongly 3,500 years before the present, and certainly that potential was there even earlier. The landscape that you see here is fairly typical. All the forest that you're seeing there is uh, uh, plantations of eucalyptus, an exotic tree brought in from Australia. So the native Andean forests in many places that are inhabited by people, in fact, are not present on the landscape. And instead, what you find is a matrix of shrublands in many areas. Because of the prevalence of human impact, many slopes are altered. This is a pretty dramatic case in Pisac of bench terraces that are still present. But if you look in the back here, that entire slope there has been modified at some point for agriculture. And again, that's sort of the status quo, that we assume that human impact is prevalent ancient and has dramatically changed the environments there. One possibility, this is that a typical scene of that shrubland that I mentioned, which would characterize much of the land cover of the central Andes that I'm talking about, um, was probably associated with um, some sort of species extinction, but we don't know. So the, as the Andean forests of the past, which could grow there in terms of climate, were replaced by land use and development of agriculture in this part of the world, we had a, a potential for dramatic changes in biodiversity. But there's also a present day change and change looking towards the future. So one of the ways to study change that doesn't work so well with plants is you can actually talk to people and ask them their impressions that, believe it or not, is some, not something that's taught in botany classes, so I had to learn how to do that. Um, this gentleman lives in a series of structures. It's actually one household. 
setting up at 4,900 meters elevation. He was born in one of these uh, shelters, lived there his entire life, and he has actually really good information on how climate change has been affecting his backyard, essentially. Um, all of this peak, when he was a child, was covered by ice, and he has watched the glaciers retreat for the last 20 or so years. He can say exactly how he changed his land use. In simple terms, it was to shift up and take advantage of these exposed areas to move his cattle, his sheep, and his horses that he's raising up to a higher elevation, so a change in pasture land. So what I wanted to do in terms of climate change in the Andes is first, it's very visible, it's very important it's to think about um, what you might do if you're interested in how those biophysical factors are changing the vegetation, is look at connecting these two boxes. So here's one part of a potential coupled system. Uh, temperature on the increase, at least in many parts in the very high Andes. Uh, increase in carbon dioxide, which we know is global, but might potentially affect uh, the dominance of particular plant species that might be sensitive to those increased levels. Uh, in the Andes, a lot of the parts I'm talking about, so say central Peru south, are predicted to be drier in the future. So I put that arrow facing downward. In fact, there are some parts of the Andes, the northern Andes are predicting the reverse. So it depends a little bit on where you are. And certainly something that's um, happening, but not well documented, not documented, is that where the cloud forests are, it's apparently changing. So the belt of persistent clouds has shifted upwards in the mountain. So where you would have true cloud forests is a little bit higher in elevation than it was 20 years ago. All these things, I believe, will be progressive changes and will continue to change vegetation. The, the particular species that are most common or most dominant, their abundances, and then connected to that, all sorts of ecosystem parameters that follow the plants and then the animals that follow the plants and, and so on. Um, some of those would be mediated, not directly, but through changing soils. However, I mentioned that the Andes, wherever you go, unless you're in some really far away place, there's people. In fact, I've done things like be completely alone, sit down on a rock to rest, and someone walks by me, <laughs> and you think you're far, far away, and in fact, you're not. Uh, the, my idea then is that people are always observing the landscape, and they will shift to take advantage of newly available resources. So I can imagine, for instance, a scenario where those pasture lands change in that example I just showed you, where people perceive that, in this case, that man who lives right near the snow line, this is very obvious to him, that pasture lands are up. He would change his, if he has the capacity, that is, can he buy another cow and take it up the hill? Um, perhaps he has to do that by collecting things together in a collective, um, community-based or family-based um, group to, to make those changes, but then shift up their land use, alter this, which then potentially feeds back and alters their potential. So it might change the pasture land, quality of the pasture, which then changes the land use and so on. What I'm finding is that just studying this part here without accounting for or setting up experiments that eliminate the possibility of a feedback from land use is absolutely essential. So somehow you have to build in that coupling. Um, it might be that it's great just to do this if you can set up exclosures, for instance, or exclude fire or some other thing. If not, then you have to account for the human presence. And it might be that you're interested more in the side anyway, that you're interested in how humans respond to a changing resource base. So how might that play out in the Andes that, that I know anyway? This is. Uh, one possibility, a lot of times when people are farming these slopes, it's a very hard way to make a living. The average farmer might have anywhere from five, six, seven, even 12 individual fields located over a range of elevations. So it's common that people form their farming practices in these intertwined mosaics. And as climate change will change productivity, at least according to my thinking, then the farmers could, at least at the start, use their mosaic of fields and shift varieties or shift species of crops that they're growing, or even shift the use of, of fields perhaps even higher or create new ones. The capacity to do that then to control, not that's to increase production, but to control the risk in this environment um, would be potentially available at the household level. Often you, there's community arrangements also in getting access to that land. Uh, this is a big protected area right here, Las National Park. 
So one possibility is as land use shifts up, they will shift into protected areas and there's a whole set of park people dilemmas that you would predict would, would um, be exasperated by um, climate change in the Andes. So there's a typical example of this patchwork of uh, fields with moderate kinds of year-to-year -year change, say when you look at with an El Nino event, a farmer could deal with that individually by abandoning a field or leave it in fallow for a year. There's a lot of flexibility in the system. Climate change <coughs> supposes that there might be actual need for continual reevaluation and change. Um, Jennifer Lipton and I worked on this issue. She did her PhD actually right on this side of the, on this side and the opposite side of the Cordillera Blanca. Um, and we were looking at ways to take some of that information and start putting it into policy relevant forms that people could um, maybe act on. We noted that the glaciers actually were important environmental buffers in this area. Uh, much of the farming that comes off the Cordillera Blanca depends upon uh, dry season water that's available for irrigation. And in fact, the farming season on the Cordillera Blanca is quite long compared to the Cordillera Negra right here, where there's no ice and all the agriculture is rain fed. Uh, as these glaciers have retreated, there's obviously more chance of avalanches and increases in some kinds of natural hazards and dramatic decreases in water supplies, many demands for the water actually from here to end up being used down on the coast of Peru um, for um, uh, a variety of different human needs. Another way to look at climate change is to go up to the very top of the Andes. This is an example um, that I can share with you down in, the, in southern Peru. The Calcaya ice cap, the world's largest tropical ice cap, studied in depth by Dr. Lonnie Thompson from Ohio State University for, I don't know, 29 years, 33 years, whatever it's been, his entire career. He's been working on this ice cap. This is Lonnie here. He invited Blanca up to do the botanical part of research in the year 2005. And I went along first to carry the bags, and then I suggested that we do some extra things that I'll talk about right now. What they were working on is this mummified plant right here. This is the edge of the ice cap that's been retreated. It's gone back about a kilometer in, in distance in the last 20 some years. As that happened, it exposed these plants. These plants are rooted into the substrate, so they've been sitting in this place. They got covered over by the ice 5,200 years ago. So this means that the climate change, as it's affecting this part of the Andes, probably has not had this kind of intensity or characteristics for that time period, for those 5,000 years. There's incredible opportunities to look at, well, there, there are Blanca and some colleagues are getting DNA out of those plants, and there's a continuing um, set of things that they can look at. Let me show what I wanted to look at. Uh, that was the, um, the ecological succession up there. When you go up to the very edge of the ice, in this case, we're at 5,350 meters elevation. Um, and right here is the edge of the ice. As you move away from that ice, in theory, you're going back, back through time. So essentially, we have the ability to set up a chrono sequence here. We, uh, Monty Thompson knows the rate that this has been retreating. He guesses that back, at, back up here on the corner is about 20 years old. So this surface here has been exposed um, from 20 years to zero by the time you get to the ice phase itself. So what we did then, it was set up a transect and do sampling of both soils and vegetation out that about a half a kilometer from the front of the ice, going, in theory anyway, not only in distance from the ice, but in time. Many textbooks have this sort of classic diagram of primary succession, meaning that you're starting with raw substrate, you're not starting with soil itself. In this case, you're starting with rock materials and some dust that's fallen out of, out of the ice itself. And you're starting with that and then plants are colonizing it and other organisms colonize it and you get primary succession. Uh, it's not often studied in the tropics and in fact, there's a lot of opportunities now to start at the ice, go out, of, out from it and have some sort of control on the rate that these plant communities are developing. I was impressed how fast things happen. Uh, there's an initial substrate that comes out of the ice itself, which consists of dust that's landed on the ice during uh, thousands of years, maybe, maybe as much as 10,000 years as the ice is accumulated. That dust is accumulated in the dry season, 
and it falls out and forms the initial substrate up here at the start. There's strong winds. The plants that are colonizing up near the ice are wind dispersed, makes sense. There's an incredible amount of soil weathering that goes on. So in about 15 or 20 years, I would calculate, as you go from the ice, away from the ice, you go from pHs of 6.8, which is some of the nicest soils I've ever measured in the uh, tropics, to being weathered down to 4.7 pH. So they become quite acidic. They lost uh, most of their calcium in, that, in those 20 years and a lot of their um, cation exchange capacity. Uh, Francisco will be happy to know that a lot of the surface was covered by cryptogamic crust which seem to be very important in the successional processes going on. By about 20 years out, cushion plants and low shrubs start to appear. In total, we had not a complete, but near complete species turnover along that transect. Or in other words, in 20 years time, you went from pioneer plants to the start of what was there, or what could be there originally, this high elevation tropical alpine um, uh, plants. And then when you get far enough away, you actually start to see bunch of grasses developing and other co more complex interactive processes giving patterning to the vegetation as you move away. Well, that was us as scientists looking at the ice. Here's a picture of that dust that's falling out of the ice that starts that substrate at the very start. And within about six years or so, plants start to colonize that. Um, as you, but we're not the only people watching the edge of the ice. This is actually the people who live nearby. They're at 4,900 meters elevation. They're, they're up above agriculture, uh, crop agriculture. So what they do is raise livestock. Um, in this case, uh, sheep, alpaca, and yams. And they're watching the ice actually with more interest than us because they wake up every day and they check it out. Um, we happen to have a situation where because of the topography, the livestock were not able to get into that valley we were studying. So I didn't include human coupling in that previous set of data. But in fact, a lot of these slopes are open and will be used as new pasture land by local people as they observe these changes in their environment. This is the ice cap again of Kalkaya. Another thing we noticed is down below, and we confirmed this not only with people, but with remote sensing, the, the wetlands that are down here, so the first flat part of topography away from the ice are four to five times larger than they were 15 or 20 years ago. This is probably a temporary expansion. Um, in this case, this is a very large uh, ice cap not predicted to disappear. So probably they could potentially maintain these wetlands. In other places where the ice has disappeared, it's clear that the wetlands also will disappear at some point, or at least re be reduced. Well, this is one where uh, my students have then gone on to try to get the real story out of there. So this is um, uh, uh, an endeavor by Julio in his doctoral dissertation to add in um, uh, some important historical and social elements. He's also doing the ecological sampling. So he's looking at the, the transect. The, the, he's doing his own transect in the system I just talked about. So looking at vegetation change, using remote sensing to document the land cover change. But he's also using historical archives to figure out how long people have been using different parts of this landscape, what are the rules for the establishment of new pasture land, what are the social, legal, and economic limitations on making adaptive changes to this changing environment. So um, I'm sure Julio will update us in um, a few months, a year, something. <laughs> I won't put him on the spot. I've been working for a long time in Rio Viseo National Park, located right here. It's in the northern Andes of Peru. It looks out actually on the Amazon basin, but it goes up in elevation all the way to about tree line. Uh, I started studying tropical timber lines there in 1985, so I actually have some plots of forest that were marked in 1985, and I can, in theory anyway, track tree growth and survival over a fairly long time period. I don't want to do the math, but it seems a long time. This is the park itself, established in 1983. Uh, the boundary here is the high elevation part of this environment. Down here, it's lowland tropical rainforest. These are all districts where people live, high elevation agriculture. So the landscapes on the outside of the park, the buffer zone would look like this. On this high elevation ridge here, it's tropical alpine vegetation. And then inside the park, it's cloud forest. 
So we come in a gradient then all the way from humanized landscapes to tropical alpine grasslands to inside the park where we have an interface between those grasslands and the upper edge of the, of the, of the uh, cloud forest. So we have an opportunity to look at change across that transect and to st start to stratify out the effect of land use versus climate change in the area. How far have we gotten? Well, this is um, sort of work in progress, I'll say. Uh, Brooke Crick Kintz, in a publication that came out in 2006, um, uh, work that he did is for his master's thesis back in uh, 2003, I guess it is now, put satellite imagery together of 14 years of change. This is the park boundary. This would be high elevation grasslands. This would be the upper edge, that green there, of, of cloud forest. These would be places where there's agriculture and a few Andean forests mixed in there. What he's done is he's coded in red change. So he's looking at 1987 to 2001. Change is, is red. In this case, outside the park, 25% um, of the forest disappeared in that 14 years. What happened? The human population tripled. Why? Gold prices. Um, these are gold mines on this side, and many people came in and established um, um, landscape, uh, uh, agriculture, and cut forest uh, outside the park. Inside the park, the red refers to change, but in this case, it's an increase. So during the same time period, we got 23% more forest inside the park, 34% more area in shrublands, and a lot bigger patches. And in fact, we were positioned this summer in a way we could actually see this part in here, and indeed, it's covered by new forests, places that didn't have forest previously, the, the forest is moving up above the tree line. When we first picked this up, we thought we had a park difference, that we had deforestation outside the park, protection of the forest inside the park. Now I think we are picking up an early signal of climate change, and we're going to go back um, starting this next this summer, this year, and redo the remote sensing and redo the mapping to see how change has, has progressed. It's a complicated environment. It's one that Blanc and I have been working in now for, I don't know, however many decades that was, 20 years, I guess. Um, the tree line itself is formed by 120 different species of trees and shrubs. It's one of the most complex uh, tree line situations that's ever been documented. We tried to look for similar places elsewhere, and, and in fact, it's rather unique in terms of what's been documented. You get this inverted tree line, so grass-owned areas on the bottom of the valleys, presumably because of cold air drainage, but also amplified by uh, what used to be the land use in the park before the park was established of, of burning and grazing cattle. And of course, there's been much in invasion. Uh, there's a land use story here. So even though it's a park, there are cattle raised inside the park. Last three years, they have not allowed burning. And there's still some, some livestock in impact to consider in relationship to whether climate change is driving most of the vegetation change. Um, how are we going to do that? This is last summer. So last summer we put in some uh, climate change monitoring stations. You might recognize some of these folks. That's uh, Matt Fry right there. People have a good eye. Um, what we were doing is putting in climate monitoring stations that are part of what's called the Gloria Project. There's about 220 of these in the world. The mountains of the world, high elevation peaks, are set up with permanent <laughs> monitoring stations for vegetation, one square meter plots that are marked out, inventory for plants, and then you pull everything away that would identify it so they presumably fit in with the landscape and and, um, and climate change can then act upon those plots. Uh, we did a gradient from the wet side inside the park to the drier side on the outside of the park heading towards where people were, but in each case the high peaks. Another thing we did, uh, some other people might have recognized Alexandra Ponet. Alexandra Ponet, she has an NSF um, postdoctoral fellowship to study the establishment of woody plants, and she hopes to do a series of experiments, so not just observational, but to try to manipulate uh, and judge really what it is that's controlling or encouraging establishment of woody plants into the area. And if you know Alexandra there, she is being enthusiastic about the size of the plants I guess she's going to be finding future. Um, much of the, she did some reconnaissance this last summer, much of her initial field work being done this summer. Another thing we've been able to do inside Rio Sail Park is have this time perspective. We're talking about climate change. It's good to know how long that's been going on. And in fact, we have colleagues who 
we're able to put together a 17,000 year record for vegetation change in the park by taking a core from a lake within the park. Um, the person doing most of the writing analysis is Mark Bush. Barbara Hansen did the pollen ID. Don Rodbell figured out the glacial history of this park. And then Blanc and I and a host of others, you can tell, helped out with the interpretation. Uh, one of the things that's relevant to making policy suggestions, you see here, and it's not a surprise that people work with these paleo records, here's Alder acting very differently than, say, Eddie Osmum or the Millistomes or the Bear, Bearberry or Mycenaeus. In fact, species act individualistically. And you can see that back through 17,000 years of time, and you can predict that future climate change would involve species acting independently and in changing their abundance. It was those kinds of observations that um, I contributed to an effort. I, the, the scopes is the scientific committee on the promotion of environmental science. Did I get it right? That, that, that's doing a volume on change in biodiversity with climate change in the Andes. Um, and we put together a chapter day full that Conservation International and myself and a host of others recommendations for what might happen in the Andes. As a generalization, some species, those A's, will stay in place, not be affected by changes in temperature precipitation. Some species will probably shift and shift upwards if they're controlled by temperature. Species that are more controlled by moisture might shift separately to other parts of the Andes, meaning that in terms of conservation, you're unlikely to have a stable flora, and in fact, you're likely to get new vegetation types that don't currently exist which changes really dramatically what you might think of as your conservation goals. Saying the same thing, but looking down on it, so this would be a distribution of a species, a big block, that under climate change scenario in the Andes, that being warmer and drier, would become smaller distributions, more fragmented. So if those are species of concern, you'd have to protect places that were moist, places that you could um, uh, prioritize these species that are found in smaller distributions. There's going to be another set of species, though, that have larger distributions, those that are adapted to warm and or dry conditions that have, would have larger ranges if there are conservation interests in the challenges not to protect them, but to provide the possibility for landscape matrices that allow movement of these native species through them. A big challenge, then, is to how to relate that to the protected area system in Peru. Currently, 14% of the country is under some sort of national protection. They're all coated with different colors, which represent the fact that the current Peruvian protected area system is actually very diverse in terms of how much human land use is permitted inside the protected area, whether it's used for extraction, whether it's used for sustained harvesting, whether it's used for strict protection, um, and so on. However, there's a lot of things built into the system planning that don't adapt it for the future climate change. And in fact, people are very concerned about species that are well protected now in a protected area, and as their distributions change in the future, whether that park will continue to serve those protective fun functions. Another thing, though, that goes on in Peru is if you take a look at the species themselves, there's some 5,500 species of plants in Peru that are only known from Peru, that are endemic to Peru, and only about 17% or so happen to be inside these protected areas. In fact. 80 some, 85, 86 percent of Peruvian endemic plants are outside the protected area. So instead, we need to talk about conservation strategies in those inhabited landscapes I mentioned earlier, where you might predict the same changes, but much more challenging if there's species of interest that you're trying to follow that shift through these inhabited landscapes. This is a endemic species we've been we spent uh, Christmas vacation trying to find, going up in valleys looking for Orthopterygium. Um, documenting thoroughly in early January what valleys it did not grow in. Um, we know now some places where they grow and some places where they definitely are not found. The context then is climate change, but the, the social issues are much more diverse. So that coupled part includes things like change in agriculture, change in livestock goals, burning, deforestation, wetlands, and so on, but also connects to the cities, urbanization, globalization in its broad sense, and in the case of Peru, really dramatic changes in governance that had to do with neoliberal reform. So all of a sudden asking a plant ecologist to get well beyond his zone of comfort and try to incorporate some of these big social changes. Uh, this is one example of things we've gotten into. 
in terms of um, making policy suggestions. Uh, there is a increased interest in mineral extraction and, and petroleum extraction in the country. Uh, this is a situation where uh, there's a proposed copper mine right here, located in cloud forest on the border with Ecuador. That's Ecuador over there. The deforested part is Peru. The proposal is to put in a copper mine that would be the fifth or sixth largest in the world. Uh, we went in, and this was a situation where uh, the local people protested. There was violence. There was um, confrontation and so on. Um, and the local people organized then in response uh, to the imposition of the mining company into what they consider their lands by recruiting, in our case, scientists to go in and take a look and offer our opinion. And in fact, what we found, and what I think is going to be the case in many other areas, is that the footprint itself of the mine, probably this one right here, is actually relatively small. So from some perspectives, increasing mines in the country, it seems like a small amount of damage. However, in terms of local perceptions, it's huge. It represents really what they consider a threat, a threat to their livelihood. Um, so scales of effects, but scales of perceptions of effects is really quite important. Um, I'm going to use that as a transition, say that the same thing is going on in the Amazon. In this case, this is the Amazon part of that, of northern Peru, completely um, designated now for petroleum explore, exploration and uh, extraction. Uh, but I have to comment that when I did the environmental impact assessment of this copper mine, uh, that's also 2005, I felt like I was reaching my personal limit to where I was going from being a scientist, making an evaluation that I tried to be objective about, to becoming an actor in the very process. And in fact, I did become an actor and got accused of things on the radio and stuff like that. It actually crossed my, um, my threshold for what I'm comfortable with as a scientist, but I recognize that everybody has differences in terms of how much advocacy they're able to do while still working from a scientific paradigm. And that's just to show me being uncomfortable by not fitting in. <laughs> and it's also my transition down to the Amazon. All right, so here we are with the oil concession down in the Pastaza River. This is the Pastaza River itself. Coming from Ecuador, a lot of the Pastaza is in Ecuador. Uh, I can briefly mention Ophelia's right here. So her study um, is located on the Ecuador side of the um, of the Pastaza region. And on the Peru side is the, the work of Mariana. So she's looking at an area that's designated for petroleum extraction. The local people have blocked that, at, and the petroleum companies sort of are on standby. Um, in the meanwhile, she's looking at the ability of people to get access to natural resources they needed, both in terms of fish and in terms of uh, timber extraction. She's working with the Kandoshi people, one of the indigenous groups here. By listening to, to, by visiting several times and by listening to Mariana's evaluation, I was really struck by how you need to understand very different value systems when you're thinking about resource extraction on indigenous lands. And some really hard things to incorporate into sort of traditional biodiversity conservation planning where people's uses and goals may not be the same as what biodiversity conservationists would like to see happen. Um, another thing that's important is that the waters here are connecting to the Andes. So this is not showing up very well, but the north, central northern part of Ecuador feed the Pasasa River. So rainfall up in the Andes controls what's going on with the river. So in a lot of cases, it's what rain fell up in Ecuador that affects the dynamics of the, of the flooding regimes down below. All the other things that go on with climate change might well be happening. In the Amazon, it's thought many places will be drier, many places will have a longer dry season, fire will become more important, um, which would presumably affect not just forests, but ecosystems that include fish and so on, the aquatic environments. Uh, we had an opportunity to look not at the indigenous people, but at the colonists who have um, um, values that have to do more with extraction and selling and so on. Um, we, this is a project that Kelly Cruz and I put together we were taking advantage of a especially dry year in 2005 to look at that as a way to study vulnerability of land use systems in this part of the Andes as you went through a dry period and then it got wet again into 2006 and ending up in 2007. During that time, we went to a variety of different communities, did sampling have that would give us information 
on their land use systems themselves, extraction of resources, and what products they're growing, what, what they're farming. Uh, we were able to get some funding that allowed us to do this in high class. We got the whole research vessel with a cook, which is a great way to do research, and you can just pull up to the town, uh, do sampling and do interviews. We were taking advantage of a particularly low time period in terms of uh, water levels. It made the national news because the cities in the western Amazon and all the way out to the central Amazon um, actually had deficient water supplies. The city of Iquitos was, I think, three weeks with no drinking water. Um, so one of the wettest places in the world in 2005 was actually put through water stress. In the papers, it seemed like a real disaster. When we got out there, in fact, local people living in the floodplain said, well, yeah, well, we seem much worse than this. It's really no big deal. Where it was a big deal was in the city. So the cities turned out to be the fragile part in terms of vulnerability to climate change, not so much the folks living out here in a floodplain where you can get up to six meters of change in water in a particular flooding period. Um, I learned a whole lot by studying plants, not out in the forest, but plants that uh, farmers grow and how you grow rice is a major, is a function of the depositional processes that leave particular sediment sizes in river, um, uh, river in, in depositions that are exposed and then can be used for growing rice. Uh, it's a flood pulse system, but we noticed as we sampled on four different rivers that in fact as you pass a juncture, one river coming into another, in fact, their land use system, calendar, when they planted crops, what species they were able to plant, changed also in a, in a fashion having to do with changing from one river system to another. Vulnerability was not that great in terms of the, the changes in the river levels. People seemed to be able to adapt their system to it. Um, there was a, a master student, Amy McCleary, was able to actually map out the part of the river that's affected by these two big rivers coming together, the Marañón and the Cayale, using multi-temporal um, remote sensing to get a, a finer grain look at how those systems change through time. We found a lot of things that we're still working through in terms of how uh, the rising waters and high waters give you very different planting seasons and, and availability of resources. Um, compared to when you have descending waters or when the water is at a low stage. Um, we found that where the river was coming from, where it was connected to the Andes was really important. We would pick up El Nino records. People would say, the biggest flood that I remember, and it would be the biggest flood they remember from an El Nino year. So we actually were able to trace back an Andean connection to decisions being made down in the lowlands. Um, what's different about working with people is I went trying out my ideas on them, just like I'm giving you some ideas and generalizations, and they would answer back and say, no, you're wrong. It's not really about the physical environment at all. I'm much more worried about pests and credit and transportation, things that I never would have considered. So that's what you got students for. So Mario Cardoso then grabbed those ideas and others, and he's actually doing systematic sampling. This is the city of Iquitos, 350,000 to 400,000 people right here. But there's land use out along the road, along the river, and different distances and different difficulties for market, and he's going to be able to say with some precision how land use decisions are changed as a function of accessibility to these big urban markets. I found then that the Andes were very important, even out in the Amazon. They control the flooding regime, but they also control the nature of the rivers, and so what you can plant and where has as much to do with where the water comes from as the flooding regime itself. Um, we found that there was an ensol record even down in the Amazon. In El Nino year, in the Amazon is usually dry. Here we have massive floods. So ironically, in the Western Amazon, you have big floods and you have little precipitation. A very different El Nino signal than has been documented in other parts of the Amazon because of the closeness to the Andes. Uh, as, we, as we moved along in our settlements, there was a very clear trend that closer or more accessible to the big city made a big difference. Um, but I also remember that as we moved away and started to incorporate the land use decisions of indigenous people like the Kandoshi that Mariana is working with, they have very different goals that may or may not be easily understandable um, in terms of what they're after. Uh, I usually go to the field to get away from cities. In this kind of work, we kept finding that, that the city was the organizing feature on land use decisions even many days away from in terms of travel 
away from that city. Um, and then the river itself, fluvial dynamics, and that ENSO feature that comes through. This is a part of Iquitos that floods every year, the poor part of town. Um, this part here is designed to flood, so people have their first story, and then during the high water season, they'll just move by boats from their second floor. So people can adapt. Shacks that are on pontoons float up and down in order to um, be adapted to the changes in the rivers. So in conclusion, then, I think coupled systems approaches are useful. What I like about it, especially, is the flexibility. You can do just the plant ecology part as long as you consider the possibility for complications from land use. You can do the land use part and see how it affects vegetation and land cover as long as you're sensitive to the fact that in the high Andes anyway, you're being exposed to dramatic climate change consequences. So land use itself probably is accommodating those changes and I would think that a coupled system approach would be the most productive one. There's going to be feedback that's going to be complicated. Um, we ran into temperatures, glaciers, seasonality, and hydrological connectivity being the themes that held uh, the physical part together of the coupled systems and institutions, livelihood, land tenure repeatedly showing up as controls on the land use side and the coupled system approach hopefully bringing those elements together. Thank you. changes the land cover that I'm interested in. So yes, definitely there's an active part that's meant to be of that arrow coming back and actually affecting the land cover itself. And affecting things other than just the land cover. Certainly. Yeah, well no, it's huge. I mean, land, land uses, that you could do multiple connections to many other boxes. I've just chosen to do the land cover part that connects to vegetation. Appeared to have been deglaciated some 5,000 years 
right. Uh, it's, uh, no, it's no. Had, it's no, had a pleasure for the last 5,000 years, but that's uh, it. That's right. Yeah. Right. Got it. And, and that humans have been using these areas for some 9,000 years. So I was just wondering whether there were indications whether when that, before that was covered by a glacier, was that actually used by humans? And could that have impacted the succession you're now seeing, even though it was 5,000 years ago? <laughs> yes, but my mind is spinning to try to think how you would do it, how you would show it. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting suggestion that even if we're picking up these plants that are 5,000 years old, it's not necessarily the case that it was just climate influencing their distribution 5,000 years ago. I would guess in this particular case that it was climate, but you're right. I mean, that, that's another situation where we would have to build in the expectation, the possibility that human influence is there too. Um, I guess I'll have to dodge. I just don't know. <laughs> For this particular environment, I, there were people nearby at 5,000 years before present. Yes. So they could easily track it up. In Rio we say where we have uh, better data, I think, um, people came in 9,000 years before present. And they'd show up in the archaeological record in caves, and they show up in the, the pollen and, and charcoal record. Uh, but dramatic landscape change started 3,500 years before present. And you can see people are moving in after the glaciers left, and then they were sort of re-establishing a more intensive land use about 3,500 years ago. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, are the terraces being maintained, and are they building new terraces and new land as, as in response to climate change, where they can go higher now? My experience is that most of the terracing that you see is abandoned and has been abandoned since um, the conquest times. Um, so there are some that are put back into use. A lot of times by sort of modern economic decision making, the work involved in putting those back into shape is not worth it because the price you get for those kind of products in the market is really low. And so people a lot of times just get by with using either old terraces or even on terraced land. If they're not terracing, because I know that's an issue elsewhere in the world, if they're not maintaining the old terraces, does that mean soil erosion rates are going way up? They're still farming the land, but they're not maintaining the old terrace system. There's an area in Spain like that where they're just yeah. they're just trashing the place because they're not it's the, costing the thing much that, to maintain terraces. The thing that I would have to think through and parse out is that and even the populations dramatically crashed after the conquest. So one sure. of the things that happened was not just decision making changing and economics changing, but pop rural populations crashed to maybe 20% of what they were and then started to come back up. During that crash period, probably there was more forest and less soil erosion than many times in their records. So you would probably have to separate out sort of pre-conquest, post-conquest, and then more recent. And I don't have a good answer for you as to how that would play out for soil erosion. I'm wondering about the effects on fire, and we talked a little, a little bit about this, but there was an article published in the last year or so on a fire increase in the Andes post-European arrival, high-resolution charcoal. There are not a whole lot of high-resolution charcoal records from South America in general. But the overwhelming signal in the Amazon is, is a decrease, a marked decrease in fire after 1500. So my question is, why the difference? Is this, do you think it's a widespread signal? Have you thought about it that much? You're looking at, at ENSO a little bit, and, and there's some effects that are tied to ENSO drought. But why? And, and I don't know. You know, I don't know that much about the, the fire regime in the Andes. Why? Why are they finding increase in charcoal in the Andes uh, in recent centuries that, that wasn't seen post-conquest down in, in the Amazon? My answer might be a little glib because I haven't thought about it in any great depth, but the livestock that were brought in by the Spaniards are especially useful, I mean the fire is especially useful for management of landscapes where you're trying to run cattle and sheep. Um, previously there were landscapes that were not used for those purposes. There were young and but not, not anything like the intensity and extensive use that you got post-conquest. So having more fire in the Andes after the Spaniards arrived makes sense to me in terms of the, the livestock that would have been there needed that kind of landscape management. The Amazon, you're talking about huge population crashes there, not bringing in big livestock that required open forested areas and loss of big populations out there 
So it would make sense in that context to have less fire. Like I said, that's just sort of a fast thinking on my feet what might explain something that might actually be much more complex. I was wondering about the institutional reaction to climate change, uh, comparing it to the global north, and have you perceived any kind of you know, governmental uh, initiative in understanding climate change and uh, documenting these, some, some of these you know, human uh, responses or human adaptability? And, and, and you're the thinking reaction the same kind as in the global oh, north? Or? And, and you're thinking where I've worked on in Peru, essentially, to be able to project out. Um, I gave a climate change talk, I don't remember what it is, four years ago, and maybe I'm wrong, but I gave it sort of as a intellectual curiosity thing. So look, we're out there, the glaciers are going by, and then we can study plants, studying it, and talking to an academic crowd, and there was some response, actually, and I got interviewed on TV, even <laughs> managed to stumble through a 12-minute interview on TV about it. But it was, like I said, sort of a curiosity thing. Climate change was in the international news, and it was sort of interesting. Now in the last two years, I would say, every single day in a typical Peruvian newspaper, it's talking about climate change. It is, in every single day, it's an issue now. And in the Andes, it's an issue because of water. So they're seeing great threats to water supplies for millions of people living in urban areas that depend upon the high elevations of the Andes for their water. Um, it's viewed as a risk to not just national security, but individual security. So I would say people are much more concerned about it in there as an average than an average person hearsay. And they also feel more victimized because they feel like less, they're adding less to the problem and being much more victimized by these globally imposed um, changes. No more questions? So I guess at this point we will uh, invite everybody to the cactus afterwards if you have any less formal questions. And thank you, Ken.